Hi all, I have an absolutely amazing iconic game of Bobby Fischer to show you. This is Fischer against Lamshuren Magmashuren, played in the Seuss Interzonal Round 3 in 1967. Now, Magmashuren, you might not know everything about him. He's a four times Mongolian chess champion, and he's actually won individual gold medal medals at Olympiad, Olympiads, including Leipzig uh, 1960. Awarded the IM title in 1966, and he even still plays today on the in Internet Chess Club. I've played him actually five times. If you want to check out, if you want to search for Kings Crusher Blitz, hash like 190 325 604 607 3729. So, an avid chess enthusiast in his own right. So, let's see his game against Bobby Fischer back in 1967. Fischer played e4, and we have the French defense. And now we have Fischer playing d3. The King's Engine attack system is set up now. d5, knight d2. So keeping uh, the pawn protected and also avoiding any potential exchange of queens here. Knight f6, we see g3. c5, bishop g2, knight c6, knight gf3, bishop e7, both sides castle. And now Fischer does venture e5. Sometimes this pawn might be vulnerable. Knight d7. Here it seems as though white is able to hold on to that pawn. And black actually plays b5 here. Very aggressive queenside play plan. If the pawn is undermined immediately, it's kind of interesting what white should do. Uh, perhaps taking. And here... With the pawn chain slightly uh, undermined, maybe c4 is a kind of key move uh, to try and undermine it further. And it gives white a, a promising small edge. Black's got some light square weaknesses now. Backward pawn on e6, nice e4 square. White should have a small edge there with the move c4. Uh, okay, so black though didn't want to try undermining the e5 point. So we have b5. Knight f1, b4, h4. So this does provide a hook on g5, a5. As though black may be interested primarily, I believe, in a4, a3. And if that provokes this, then black has knight a7 to b5, I mean, to c3. That's a positional maneuver. Playing for b3 is risky because of a, b, tactically, you know, it's going to take more time. That might be the key maneuver to entrench a knight on c3 here. Uh, again, just to check out f6 in this position, it seems as though here actually maybe a3 is more appropriate. Uh, and now c4, this still has uh, some magic to it to give white a small edge. White can get a nice grip on the dark squares here, uh, at least. And again, we've got the backward pawn issue. So um, a5, though. And now this kind of strangle hold on the e5 square, what Nimzovich would call overprotection and in fact it's overprotection without any even g5 possibility for the moment this pawn has a duality to it it could become a form pawn later it could weaken uh, f6 critically or maybe sometimes it opens up lines so we have a4 and now yes this a3 plan is is annoying with the idea of maybe putting a knight to c3 uh, so aggressive uh, again, here just to check f6 break because that seems to be, you know, if you were looking for liberating moves to try and activate some pieces if activity was a high priority. But again, the move c4 here does seem to work, if, especially if the queens come off. White has a nice possession of the d5, and again, backward pawn target, you know, knight g5, bishop h3, doubling rooks, things like that are ideas. So black, yeah, really has to put up with this bind in the center and trying to get some queenside counterplay. But now Fisher plays a3, which slows black's plan somewhat down. As an interesting uh, scenario of h5, just to show a3, how it could be dangerous with b3. h6, and it might be difficult for white to arrange uh, an attack on the king. You might think, well, just pile everything up on h6 and sacrifice. It might not be so great. For example, this position, black plays d4 and it will have knight c3. And what is the show for the peace sack? White needs to have a bit more uh, to the attack than that example. 
So uh, yeah, it, it is pretty dangerous. So A3 Fisher's treading with caution here, not putting all his eggs in one basket. It doesn't want to damage the C3 square. So B takes, B takes knight A5. Now knight E3 is a bit of provocation on route rather than say this route. It seems as though Fisher wants to also tease maybe D4, which weakens the E4 square, which could be a pivot for to attack black on both sides of the board. This E4 square, if D4 is ever played, a type one type style decision, a committal decision. So this is a teasing route, knight E3 Fisher's chosen, it seems. Also, sometimes there might be something to do with knight takes d5, I guess, as well. Bishop a6, bishop h3. Okay, so here, now, black is teased into d4, funny enough. And, in fact, the knight doesn't even use the g4 square, it just steps back. Uh, you might wonder why. On knight g4, okay, it looks aggressive, but say black plays c4, uh, then this position, white's okay actually. So, but black doesn't have to play c4, doesn't have to commit to c4. Say so black just plays king h8, and we get this kind of position. Uh, this should be about equal. White doesn't technically, it seems, have anything great here going on. Black does have a nice diagonal, maybe snaps off on d6, and has has c4 prospect uh, later, or a target on d6. So it should be about even. So anyway, Fisher shied away from knight g4. The knight just went back to f1 for the moment. Knight b6. Now knight g5. So in fact, if the knight had gone to g4, this queen would have been interrupted from access to h5 to hit a soft spot. So the soft spot is a big priority to be able to target it. Uh, we have knight d5 here. And now the bishop retreated to d2. So guarding that c3 square. On queen h5, then bishop takes, uh, bishop takes, queen e8 is a key move, uh, defensive resource, which should be sufficient for black after f5 hitting the queen for at least equality. This position should be fine. Uh, it is easy for black to go wrong, uh, just, uh, for sake of argument, if black plays h6 here, if you have similar positions, you might have a faster time controls. With this setup, eyeing the soft spots f7 and e6 as well, there is actually knight takes f7, bishop takes. This is actually quite devastating. For example, winning d5 there. And here, if knight takes f4 for a better resistance, that hits uh, the queen. Then again, this position actually has dangers for black. Uh, let me just show you with rook b6. Uh, so if white's piling up on the b-file, black's in a kind of bind there. And if rook a6, then taking, and now rook b1 with a cute idea. I wonder if you can spot it. If I give you five seconds, what would white play in this position? Five seconds. Okay, rook b8 to deflect the queen away from f7. So these are behind the scenes, fascinating stuff, I thought, anyway. Uh, so, but Fisher's move, the genius... Bobby Fisher actually doesn't go in with Queen H5. So again, pretty non-committal for the moment, waiting to pounce like a cat, waiting to pounce on its prey, patiently guarding C3, not going all in just yet. But now after Bishop takes G5, we have actually Bishop takes G5, Queen D7, and now Fisher does go all in with Queen H5 here, having that dark square Bishop without the counterpart. What has he in mind here? Uh, f6 seems really out of the question now because of e6 it just seems like that would be a big target we have rook fc8 knight d2 so white's able to use that lovely e4 square which was provoked earlier as a weakness knight c3 uh here c4 might have been a better try for black because the knight does stand guard over the f6 square in this position so there's a kind of weakness of the last move generated by knight c3 perhaps uh, if c4 for example d takes this position it seems as though black should should be okay even if there's a an attack like this there seems to be some resources for black uh, to try and uh, maintain equality so that's a little bit unclear so anyway knight c3 though does create a kind of weakness of the last move it neglects uh, f6 doesn't immediately seem to threaten too much it does clear away i guess the diagonal if if black wants the sort of 
uh, correct battery soon. But now Bishop F6, key move of the game, really uh, a very very powerful move. So the immediate threat now is Queen G5. So Fisher did pounce on that kind of weakness of the last move. Uh, so Queen G5 would tempt dark square weaknesses, which are basically fatal. So Black needs to step the Queen to F8 to be able to handle a scenario where uh, that's not fatal, where Queen F8 defends. So we have Queen E8. Uh, so here, um, if Knight D5 is an example, Queen G5, and uh, the form pawn would be uh, chat mating here if we look at this. So knight takes the, the killer form pawn <laughs> would be a killer here because the queen's on the light square. Queen h6 would just be chat mating. One mini game with a form pawn like that. Uh, so anyway, um, so in the game g6. Sorry, not in the game. We have queen e8 in the game on knight d5 as another example. Queen g5, g6, queen h6 is again chat mating. Okay, so queen e8. Now knight e4 was played. g6. Uh, just to consider some alternatives instead of g6. If knight takes e4, rook takes. This is dangerous. After rook g4, this position, white's building up a lot of pressure. And it is so dangerous. For example, rook takes g6 check here. Bishop takes. And queen f4. This position is very, very good for white. So, yeah, it's getting extremely dangerous for black's king. g6, queen g5. We have knight takes e4. And now the rook plays to e4. It has some versatility. It might be able to switch a, a glamorous rook lift on the fourth rank. Quite rare. c4, h5, yes. And the, and the rook is going behind the pawn. The pawn's being used to blast open some extra open lines. Okay, so this is getting extremely uncomfortable. Black is getting some, it seems, counterplay over here, but statistically, if you're going for the king and the opponent's going for your queen side, it's statistically the king's engine attack has been favoring white, as you might expect intuitively, because you know the king's at the end of the line here for being checkmated. Uh, and we have rook h4 in these kind of positions. So rook h4. C takes D is also pretty strong. White's position is pretty strong by this point. In fact, there's a really cute line with rook takes D4 and rook D7 trying to deflect the queen away from F8. Uh, so if queen takes, then we have back to uh, queen H6. Black would have nothing better than give up the queen. Uh, but this, this, there's a cuteness here. I, 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 I have to show. Uh, so rook. Uh, d7 there's actually rook ad1 trying to deflect the bishop away from g6 this is really cool as well after hg there's queen h6 mating and also uh f um fg then there's queen h6 hitting not just g7 but h7 so yeah there's these crushing lines here behind the scenes uh even on uh even on c takes d3 here if white just played c takes d3 but white plays rook h4 is going all in now rook a7 okay if d takes c2 here then hg hg rook h8 is checkmate and if fg then can you see what white plays in this position if i give you five seconds starting from now okay rook takes h7 and then it doesn't matter what black's doing. That's that's uh, going to be check there, a key check there. So actually, time to take black's pawn out and still checkmate black. So even in that outcome, uh, yeah. So that that's a fun one. Yeah, rook takes h7. Otherwise, if um, king takes, then there's this check, check all checks comes to mind. Uh, checkmating like that, for example. So rook a7 was tried. Bishop g2, and you might wonder. Bishop g2. So, why is the bishop interested in this diagonal? What is there on this diagonal which is so interesting? In fact, so black plays d takes c2. If black tries to parry the diagonal just in case with bishop b7 instead of d takes c2, then hg, fg, can you see what white plays here? I'll give you five seconds. 
Okay, there's a weakness of the last move there. The, the rook's no longer covering h7. So it's an open invitation for a rook takes h7. Check, check. And that, that pattern that we've seen before, that mating pattern. So hg, if hg here, then there's rook h8 checkmate. So uh, black plays d takes. Now queen h6, and we reach the iconic position I've shown, I've shown to many of my uh, online students recently. Um, by the way, check out my coaching profile at Leech, if you want to check out uh, for coaching. <laughs> but here, yeah, I go through a lot of Fisher game finishes. And one of my uh, my courses at chessworld.net, if you want to check it out as well, is um, with this position. So this position is reached. Queen f8 was played. So white to play and win here. A really superbly beautiful finish now. Is played by Fisher. I wonder if you can work it out to the end if I give you five seconds to pause the video. So if you've not seen this game finish before, you're in for a treat if you can work it out in the two main key variations. So 500 points for each that you calculate. So starting from now, okay, if you want to pause the video rather, please pause it and work out the two key mating variations. Okay, it's a beautiful check all checks is is the thing in chess you need to do all the time. And the spirit of check all checks is the check forcing moves of high priority. But here there's an absolutely killer check, not so outrageous, because you need to do you need to really check these out. The game ended here. If it carried on, H takes G. Now the simpler of the two uh, variations is if the king uh, steps back, then there's rook H eight checkmate. And the more subtle one is if the king steps out, then I hope you saw the final key move. Bishop e4 is checkmate there. So a superbly beautiful finish. Uh, that kind of fills me from for with joy every time I, I even test people on this position with this queen sack. Uh, the joy of chess. So the king's engine attack to me has a very cozy feel to it and that was in a part of Fisher's career where he wasn't uh, testing the most theoretical lines against the French defense later he used the winner variation quite a bit against the French but at this point uh, you know the King's engine attack was a great system of choice and in fact there's a fantastic uh, course at Chessable if you want to check out that bit.ly link there. So Chessable is a fantastic site for online interactive courses. So the bit.ly link to capital N small s TCBG. Uh, so if you want to check that out and you'll see actually my preview of that course recently done there, which actually inspired this video. So thanks to Chessable for inspiring this recap uh, revisit of this classic game. I have covered this game in the past, but not so in much de so much detail. But you can see behind the scenes there were some key things going on. In some of the variations, c4 is often the key move, which actually the chessable course does mention to try and liberate this bishop. So in some variations, yeah, Fisher's a3 kind of stopped the c3 disasters too too quickly. The attack brewing up was just superb. The provocation to get the e4 square earlier, and the e4 became that central pivotal square, not just for the rook, but for the bishop later to deliver in this variation the final uh, checkmate. A really iconic game and a beautifully iconic finish. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Thanks very much.